All right, we're certainly thankful to be here this evening. And uh, I was trying to think, uh, I think it's been maybe three or four years since since we've been down here, but uh, thankful to be back. Uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> thankful this evening have uh, most of our folks from Charleston here with us. Uh, uh, some of our ladies are away at a ladies retreat this weekend, so uh, but we still have a mess of kids and everything else, so thankful for them and all that's come. Good to see everybody. And uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> Well, Brother John tried to force me to title this message, so um, I guess I'll, I'll stick with it. Uh, I would call this, uh, Don't Neglect the Gospel. Um, it's a topic that I've preached on several times uh, over the last several years. Um, just something that presses heavy upon me is the need to be clear about the Gospel, to be consistent in preaching the gospel and to be continuous in preaching the gospel. So let's go here to Matthew chapter 5. We'll begin with verse number 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now this... Uh, verse that I've taken is out of a section of what we usually refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. It runs through Matthew uh, chapter 5 through um, chapter 7, probably the uh, most famous sermon ever preached in, in history. Uh, most everyone uh, has heard of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and when you come to the Sermon on the Mount, one of the, one of the things that I find interesting about this is that this is where uh, philosophers will point to and they'll refer to Jesus, if they don't deny his historical existence, they'll say, well, he was a good ethical teacher. And they'll point to the Sermon on the Mount as an example and say, well, you know, Jesus was a, was a good moralist. He was a, a good ethical teacher. Um, the problem with that is that that just really doesn't work. It's just not true. Um, not, not in the sense that it's, that it's meant. Because even if you look at it from a, a non-spiritual level, you, you can't, on the one hand, call him a good man, a good teacher, and a good example on the one hand, and then, on the other hand, reject a great portion of what he actually taught. Because really, when you, when you do that, that's what you're doing. You're saying, well, pick out a few things. It's probably a good idea not to kill your neighbor, and it's probably a good idea not to commit adultery, and it's probably a good idea to, you know, not to steal and, and this and that. But, but taking those things, but rejecting everything else, that he taught. He taught that he was the Savior. He taught that he was the Son of God in the flesh. That's what Jesus said of himself. He received worship as the Son of God. He taught that he would lay down his life for his sheep as a substitutionary offering and sacrifice on their behalf. He taught that. He also taught that all of those who do not believe on Him, repent and obey, would be cast into hell fire. That's also something that He taught. So you, you just can't have it both ways. He ends this Sermon on the Mount by declaring that those who had heard but did not do, those who heard this Word but did not obey this Word, He made a comparison. He said, you're like a man that builds his house on the shifting sand. And when the rain comes and the wind comes, what happens? The house falls. And he says, great is the destruction of that house. That's what he likened to those that would hear his words, but would not do them, would not keep them. So you just can't have it both ways. Um, either, he, either he was God, or, or, he, or he, was, he was not a good man. Because he taught that he was God. He taught that he was God in the flesh. He wasn't really a good teacher. Um, and if he is God, you can't just 
prejudicially choose a few things out that you like that he said and ignore the rest. So this is one of the interesting things that draws me to the Sermon on the Mount. Um, if you study out chapters 5 to 7, you will realize that this is indeed a sermon. Now a lot of times what happens with the Sermon on the Mount is, is people pluck out some things here and pluck out some things there. And it almost it's almost like it's just a... Just maxims, you know, it's just statements of, of good things, just statements of good morals, and just statements of good um, ethics. It's really not so. There's, there actually is a theme, there is a structure, and there, there is a flow. It, it is a sermon. All, all three chapters go together. In the beginning of, of chapter 5, verses 3 through 16, Jesus teaches there what are the true characteristics of the righteous. Now, usually we refer to those as the Beatitudes. Uh, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, and blessed are the meek, and, and so on. But really what he's laying out there are the true characteristics of the righteous, the righteous, the ones, the, the born-again ones. Throughout this sermon, he exposes the prevalent error in the interpretation of the law and really for the last part of chapter 5, beginning around verse 17 down through 48, he is um, giving the right interpretation of the law where it has been wrongly interpreted. And if you wrongly interpret the law, then you can find yourself righteous by the law. And that's part of the point that Jesus is making, because even in our text here, he said, unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, says you will in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now ultimately, what he, what he means there is not that you've got to be better than them. You, you've got to outdo them. You've got to keep more laws than what, what they are keeping. Ultimately, what he is showing is that they have misunderstood the law and are justifying themselves through their misinterpretation of the law. And only those who are made righteous in Christ has a righteousness that exceeds and enters into the kingdom of heaven. In chapter 6, he shows how the Pharisees um, attempt to establish their own righteousness by the law. He speaks of, of giving alms. He speaks of prayer. He speaks of tithes. Um, speaks of, of treasures. On and on he goes. But they actually are making void the law through those things. Beginning at about verse 7 of chapter 7, um, down through verse uh, 29, with the end of this chapter, he is giving clear instruction. He's sending out a clear message to those who are outside of the kingdom. He's sending a clear message for them to enter it. How that they are to enter it. So, what this sermon is essentially about is the holiness of God. That's really what the law is about. If you come to the law and you don't come to it with, with keeping in mind that this law is an expression of the holiness of God, you're going to misunderstand it. It's an expression of the holiness of God of which we all fall short. We all fall short. By the law is the knowledge of sin. We see just how far short we fall when we really begin to measure ourselves against that law of God. This sermon, so it's, a, it's essentially about the holiness of God and that this holiness is only to be had in Jesus Christ. It's the only way, that, this, so the only way that, that you can be made holy. But here's the thing. You, you can be made holy. You can be made holy in Jesus Christ. I, I don't care who you are. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what you have done. This, the Bible is full of sinners being made holy through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and His perfect sacrifice. So this holiness is only to be had in Jesus Christ. Now this, this verse in verse 20, I keyed on because I really believe that it is sort of a thematic verse for this whole sermon from chapters 5 to 7. That except your righteousness exceed uh, the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. By human standards, that's impossible. By human standards, that's impossible. In Christ alone, it is possible. So in between verse 20 and really what is the grand climax 
The grand climax of this sermon comes in verses 21 to 23 of chapter 7, where he says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's the, that's the grand climax of the sermon. So in between chapter 5 and verse 20, and verses 21 to 23 of chapter 7, Jesus is explaining what they have been taught. He's explaining the traditions of men that they're holding to that are misinterpretations of the law. And their practices seem to be wrong. And He proceeds to teach them the truth. Teaches them the truth. So one of the things that I also find interesting about this is this whole setting. Um, Jesus is, is preaching to a great multitude of people. And I, I find that in, in this instance of, of Jesus preaching this message, this Sermon on the Mount, that we actually have quite an interesting parallel to uh, us today. Really, it, I believe it applies throughout all generations. I say parallels because Jesus was teaching great truth here on the Sermon on the Mount. He was. So if you're looking at the Sermon on the Mount from the standpoint of what is the content of this message, He's teaching a lot of great truth in, in these three chapters. That's the content of this message. But then if you kind of step back a step further from that and you say, well, what, is this, what does this message look like and what does it sound like? So if you can in any way imagine in your mind Jesus standing and, and being surrounded by multitudes of people, what is this, what's this sermon feel like? What, is it, what does it sound like in that day? Because not only was Jesus teaching truth in the content of His sermon, He was also modeling how to preach to His disciples. They, they were there. They were with Him. He was training them. Everything that He did, in everything He did, He was training them and preparing them to continue on this work that He had begun. So what can we learn from this? Well, first of all, we have to get a, a picture of this scene. If you go back into chapter 4, um, you see that there was, was indeed a great multitude of people Verse 25 says, And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Um, Luke 6 also talks about this multitude, gives a little bit more details about it. There was an outpouring of people from all of these places um, around. The multitude was no doubt primarily Jewish people, though there also would have been uh, no doubt a number of, of Gentiles among them, uh, Greeks and Romans and such. Very probable. Of the, of the Jewish crowd, of, of this multitude, think for a moment about who is gathered there. There are, are Jews of every description. There's scribes, there's Pharisees, there's Sadducees, there's priests, there's publicans, there are shepherds, farmers, carpenters, fishermen, and also His true disciples. So, this crowd was actually a very good cross-section of the nation of Israel at that time. It had people from all the various walks of life that were in this multitude. Israel was a very religious place. It was a very um, religious place. But Jesus is showing in this sermon that it's a, a religion that had corrupted the truth and was full of hypocrisy. It was full of self-righteousness. That's, that's a big uh, message in this sermon. It wasn't that there wasn't any true faith. There was true faith. Uh, you can think of some examples like Zacharias and Elizabeth. They were examples of those that were holding to true faith. Uh, think of Simeon and Anna that were, that were taught about. I mean, they were holding to, to true faith. So it's not that there was no true faith, 
but it certainly was not in abundance, and it certainly was not in the majority. So there are certain parallels to our day. Um, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. We're really not that much that much different from this crowd. Uh, we, you know, we've got everybody here's probably got a phone. We got computers at home. We come here in a car. Uh, clothes might look a little different, but we're we're really not that different from this crowd. They they worked for a living. There was some among them that were scholars, and some that were very uneducated. There were skilled laborers, farmers, shepherds, all these all these kind of things. So especially when you think about our country today and you think about the religious areas, and there are religious areas. I, I, I lived down south for um, about eight years, and uh, it, always, it always just struck me of just how religious that the area was. Everybody went to church. I mean, that's just, that's just how it was. But to be honest with you, one of the things I saw there was church was really just more of a tradition. It was just what you did. You got up on Sunday morning, you put your Sunday morning best on, you went to meeting, then you went down to the buffet. And that's, that's just what you did. That's just how life was. You would walk into any restaurant down there. We live close to Tupelo. You'd walk into any restaurant down there, and people would just openly, all over the place, be praying before they ate. Didn't think anything about it. I had to have a meeting when we started our mission down there in Tupelo, and I was renting a building, and I had to get approval um, from the, the city council. And when I have a meeting with the city council, you find that many of those sitting on city council uh, were deacons in Southern Baptist churches, uh, um, Sunday school teachers, and, and various, various ones. One of the doctors we took our children to was a Sunday school teacher at First Baptist, Southern Baptist down there in Tupelo. The mayoral race in Tupelo, uh, one year there was a, a man that was a charismatic preacher, and his platform, now I'm, his, this is the platform he's running on, you know, what are you about, what's your candidacy about? His platform was, is that I believe God is leading me to be the mayor of this city. That was his public platform. And nobody thought that was strange. It's just interesting. So things are different. Things are different. You travel to different parts of the country, you can find some very, very religious areas. There's a church building on just about every corner. I didn't count how many that I passed on the way here that had some form of church or something on the on the sign of it. On the corner, every every community, our community where, where I actually lived had 1,100 people. And there was, I think, two dozen churches in that area. Very small area but yet all of these places. So what does all of that add up to? Well, what that adds up to is that when you talk with someone, you very rarely find someone that believes that they are a condemned sinner on the way to hell. How often do, do, you, do you come across that? Most everyone that we, that we talk to, they think that they're going to heaven when they die. Jesus said in verse 20 that except your righteousness exceeds, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. I think right now the latest statistics I've seen say about 75% of the American population believes they're going to heaven when they die. And all the while, there is rampant hypocrisy. There's a form of religion all throughout this country. There's a form of it. But they have certainly denied the power thereof. So if we take a cross-section of, of the area, we gather them in a crowd and, and we're going to preach to them, we would have a very religious crowd, by and large. Most people there would think that they're going to heaven when they die. And I've, I've uh, talked with people and I've seen... Uh, Videos were, you know, people going through the streets and asking this question, and, you know, are you going to go to heaven when you die? And, and of course, you know, some will say, well, you know, I don't believe heaven exists. And others, they say, well, yeah, and, you know, why do you think you're going there? You, well, you know, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a pretty good person. That's exactly what would be on the mind of most people. If you had a good cross-section of the area, many people think that they're saved. 
because maybe they've had some kind of crisis. Maybe they've had some, some life-threatening event that they've, that they've lived through. And maybe they've uh, repeated a prayer. Maybe they've signed a card. But here is the very chilling reality that after those things happen, most of, of the people that we see, most of that, so much of that percentage that we see that says, I'm going to heaven when I die. They live their life as if Jesus didn't exist. It really would make no change to their daily life whether that Jesus existed or not. No difference. So what do we learn from preaching or from Jesus preaching? You know, I kind of wonder sometimes, as, and I preached through the Gospel of Matthew a few years ago, and um, one of the things that struck me a lot of times as I was going through these various things when he was, uh, Christ was telling parables um, or when he was teaching, uh, and you know, there was times when his disciples, they knew that the Pharisees had gotten offended at what Jesus had said. And there were times they had asked him, and said, well, why do you speak to them in, in parables and, and so on? And it just made me think, what, what is on the mind of the disciples? What are they taking away from? What are they thinking about? They're hearing Jesus teach these things. They, of course, they believe that they are true, and then they're, they're around this crowd that they've grown up amongst and they know so well. I want you to notice something. As Jesus preaches to this very religious crowd, He does not assume that they knew the way to eternal life. He, he begins in, in verse 20 saying that, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. He does, he does not assume that this very religious crowd in front of Him knows the way to heaven, to eternal life. He, he doesn't assume that at all. In fact, he challenged them directly as he was preaching concerning the things that they had heard, the things that they had seen, the things that he exposed as, as being clearly wrong. And then he taught them the truth. In chapters 5 and 6, he mentions nine things that they had heard and seen. And then he dis demonstrated their error. You can look at it, uh, read it later, you know, talking about, um, let's give one example. In verse 21, he says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. In other words, this was a case where the, where the teaching did not, it stopped too soon. Surely the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. It does. But do you know, if you go back here in the book of Leviticus, it also tells you not to hate your brother without a cause. It also says that. But somehow that was neglected. Somehow that was left off. Thou shalt not kill. All right, I haven't murdered anybody today. Check, I'm doing pretty good. Have you harbored hatred in your heart? Have you been angry? That's not a, a, a truly just anger with them? Well, Jesus shows that your righteousness falls short in that case. In the section on loving our enemies that he gets into toward the end of chapter 5, he outraged his hearers, no doubt, by telling them that their righteousness was not even exceeding the publicans and the Gentiles. Think about how offensive that those words had to be. Look in verse 46. He says, For if ye love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. You know how offensive that that had to be? To say that your righteousness is not even exceeding the righteousness of a despised publican? Publicans were always grouped with sinners in the New Testament. They, they, were, they were despised and hated. So really when we look at it, this Sermon on the Mount ought to strike fear in the hearts of so many who think that they're going to heaven. Because what? Because they love those that love them? I, I've, I've had people tell me that. 
Well, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I take, try to take care of my family, and I ain't hurting nobody, and so, so you, you, you love those that love them, and that's, that's all you've got to put to your account? Well, Jesus exposes that. People are deceived. They think they're good enough. There, there is no good enough. There is no good enough. We, we must be changed. We must be washed. We must be cleansed. We must be made righteous in Jesus Christ. There, there is no good enough. And that becomes plain when you look at chapter 7, doesn't it? He says, many will say in that day, in that day of judgment, there are many who will say, Lord, we've done all these wonderful things. We've preached in Your name. We've cast out devils in Your name. We've healed the sick. We've, we've done all of these many wonderful works in Your name. And what does He say? I never knew You. I never knew You. They're not good enough. They're not good enough because they're not in Christ. Unless you denounce all hopes of your own righteousness in yourself and turn from those things to stand before God dressed in the righteousness of Christ alone, through faith alone, you are not going to heaven. You cannot be good enough. I cannot be good enough. The Bible says that he that does not believe on him is condemned already. In John 3, he says, The wrath of God abideth on them daily. We cannot be good enough. You know what? You've not even risen to the lowest rung, to be honest with you. Think about the publicans that he mentions here. He says, you, you, you love them that love you. He said, the publicans do the same thing. The publicans were, they were despised. And in fact, the Pharisees thought themselves unclean if they come in contact with them. They thought they were ceremonially defiled by eating with, with a public. If they would have sat down to the table and ate with a publican, that would have made them defiled. They couldn't have entered into the, they couldn't enter the temple. This is one of the things they accused Jesus of oftentimes. So in other words, if this is what you have to demonstrate your righteousness. If we went through and each one of us was called, what, what can you present? What can you present on your behalf for your righteousness? What righteousness do you have that can stand before God and can survive? That can survive. And if your answer is anything other than absolutely nothing but the righteousness of Jesus Christ Himself, you are not going to heaven. So one of the things I believe that we learn here is don't make that assumption. Don't make that assumption that people know the way to eternal life. And don't neglect to preach the Gospel continuously, consistently, and clearly. Because the Gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The Gospel is the Word of life. It's the Word of life. You know, I love that answer that Peter gave there at the end of John 6, when all this multitude that had been thronging and following Jesus around, when they all finally left, and it's just Jesus and the disciples there, and He says, will you also go away? I love what Peter says. Peter says, to whom should we go? He says, there is no other. You have the words of life. There is no other. So we must continue to strive with every fiber of our being to preach the Gospel in the clearest terms possible. And I believe we have a good example of this. Let's look at, let's look at some examples from Paul. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. Paul says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Look at verse 23 of this chapter. But we preach Christ crucified. 
unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. He would say in chapter 2, in verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Anyone that came in contact with Paul, it didn't take you very long to figure out what he was about. What was he about? What was it that was, that was a sinner in his life? What was it that, that was a, a motive? What was it that was a, a prime driving force in the life of the Apostle Paul? He says, I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He, he wasn't going to get distracted arguing about the politics of the day with those that were gathered around him. He wasn't going to, going to get, dis, get distracted by arguing uh, with, with the various forms of philosophy, the various things. He said, I, I'm not coming with wisdom of words. I'm coming with plain speech. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's what, that's what I'm coming with. That was, the, that was the center of his life. Look in, in chapter 9. Chapter 9 and verse number 16. He says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. May God give us a heart that says, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is unto me if I spend more time on all the things of the world and neglect to preach the gospel. Woe is unto me. Look in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In verse number 12, Paul says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Notice that. He says, I came to Troas to preach the gospel. There was, there was no question what he was about. There was no question about why he was where he was at. There was no question about any of that. I came here to preach the gospel. In chapter 4 and verse 5, he says, For we preach not ourselves but Jesus Christ the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul wasn't trying to advance his name. Paul wasn't trying to build his platform or his brand. Paul, Paul wasn't trying to promote anything other than Jesus Christ and His gospel. That's what he was about. That's what his mission was. What his mission was about. We could also look in statements like Romans Romans chapter 1 and verse 15. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Again, would to God that that would be a true expression of our heart. That as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel. Verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Romans chapter 15. And verse number 20. Paul says, Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation strived to preach the gospel. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 now. So, what should this look like in the midst of a church? What, 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 what role, what relationship do we have to the gospel of Christ? What sort of place should it occupy among the life of a church of the Lord Jesus Christ? What, what, what sort of place should the Gospel occupy among us? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the Gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, 
unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, that He was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve, and after that He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain under this present, but some are fallen asleep. Now if you study Paul's letter to the Corinthians, you will find chapter after chapter and verse after verse of problems in the church of Corinth. Problems in that church. There was division among the body. There was different faction, little groups that, that uh, opposed one another. To, to think that they had turned the Lord's Supper into some kind of a, of a drunken feast. And, and not only was it a drunken feast, but where Paul said there was some that was leaving hungry. In other words, there were those that were gorging themselves, glutting themselves on, on food and drink, while others that obviously were poor in the congregation that didn't have it were leaving hungry. They weren't even sharing. That, I, I look at that and I just say, how, how could that be? How could that kind of a situation ever develop? How could that be? You, you go and study here in chapter 15 and you, you realize that there was some in the church that was denying the resurrection. How can that be? How can these things be? Chapter 6 tells us about those that were suing one another in court. How could that, how could that be? In chapter 5, he, he speaks of that uh, adulterous man that not, not only were they not dealing with in any way, but he says they were even puffed up about it. How could, how could that be? Chapter 13 makes it pretty clear that, that, it was a, that it was a church that greatly lacked love. They just did not love one another in the way that, that they should. How could that be? We could go on and on with the problems in the church at Corinth. And so after all of these chapters and after all of these verses, as Paul's been addressing issue after issue after issue, and trying to straighten out the problems in these church, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Paul wasn't at some evangelistic crusade. He's writing a letter to a church, the Lord Jesus Christ. And after all this time in this letter, he says, I declare the gospel unto you. Why would he, why would he do that? Why would he do that? I, I think there are a couple of reasons. And one comes out heavily in this context. If you studied out, and you, I mean, chapter 15 is the most extensive defense of the resurrection uh, in all of the Scripture. It's a wonderful chapter. Um, if you study through there, you, you see that there were those that were denying it, and obviously there was some influence that was, was trying to deny the resurrection, um, and it was, uh, it was greatly affecting the church. So one of the reasons why, I believe after 14 chapters, Paul is declaring the gospel to the church at Corinth, rife with problems as they were. In a sense, Paul is saying, listen, I need to call you back to the very center. I need to call you back to the very core. You, you realize that when Paul arrived in Corinth, there was no church there. When Paul arrived in Corinth, there wasn't a Christian there. When Paul arrived in Corinth, he arrived in Corinth just as he did these other places saying, I'm ready to preach the gospel. And that's what he did. And what happened as a result of that? Well, you can see what happened as a result of that. Look in, look in chapter, uh, chapter 6. He says in verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. 
nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then look at verse 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. If it were not for the Gospel, you, this letter wouldn't even be written. There would be no church in Corinth. It, it, things would just be continuing as they were. So I believe that Paul is saying in chapter 15, that I declared you to the Gospel. He's, he's saying, I'm, I'm calling you back to the core. I'm calling you back to the real core of the faith. To what it is that, you, that, that should be central in your life and in the life of the church. What should be central? The Gospel of Jesus Christ. His life, death, and resurrection. That should be central in the life of the church. I believe another reason that he did this is because if you go through particularly the Gospels and many of the parables, well, here's a principle that you cannot escape. There are, are false professors among the Lord's people. You think about the parable of the sower. Think about the parable of the wheat and the tares. Think about the parable of the good and the bad fish. Think about the example of Judas Iscariot. Think about others that Paul would, would write and say they, they departed me. They loved this present world. And they went away after the riches and the cares and the things of life and have abandoned the faith. Those that John that wrote about, and he said, they went out from us because they really weren't of us. There are false professors among the Lord's people. Another reason why the Gospel should be consistently and clearly and continuously preached, even in the assembly of the Lord's people, And then another good reason not to neglect the Gospel. Another good reason not to neglect the Gospel is that we need to live with the Gospel daily. Why? Because the Gospel is continuously reminding me of who and what I am and of who and what Christ is and what He has done, and the fact that I am nothing apart from Him. If you want a church to go off into pharisaical legalism and hypocrisy, one of the quickest ways to do it is to neglect the Gospel. The Gospel shows us for what we really are. I mean, it, it, it just shows us for what we are. No, There's no, no sugar coat, no whitewash. No, the curtain is pulled back and all the ugliness is exposed. The Gospel shows us for what we are. And that we have no standing before God apart from Jesus Christ. How, how can you enter into the kingdom of heaven? Well, your righteousness has to exceed that of scribes and Pharisees. Oh, they're very zealous. How, how can my righteousness exceed that? It can't. It can't. Only the righteousness of Jesus Christ will suffice to withstand the judgment to stand before God in holiness. So we must not neglect the Gospel. Jesus didn't assume that, that the people knew the way to eternal life. He preached it. He exposed their errors. He corrected them. He instructed them. Paul did the same thing with the church at Corinth. Why do we not neglect the Gospel? Number one, it is the core. It is the very center of the Christian faith. Listen, he will go on to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that if Christ be not risen, eat and drink, and tomorrow we die. In other words, this is if Christ be not risen, this is all foolishness. The gospel is at the very center. It's at the very center. Number two, we should not neglect the gospel because of the reality of false professors among God's people. The Bible's clear about that. Number three, we not neglect the gospel because we need 
hear it continually. That if you stand here tonight, a forgiven sinner, then you stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. Not even a little bit of your own. Not even a little bit. Righteousness of Christ alone. All right, I'll stop here, brother. <clears throat>